We're gonna do a picture first. Oh. Because I did my hair special for this, clearly. Just All right. ran through the heat. You look very nice, though. Thank you. Here you this LA heat. Uh, people are still coming in. While they're coming in, you know, I, all, all morning this morning, I did college debates. I judged the college debates, and I've done those for a few years. And it's fascinating to watch these young kids talk about political issues. Did you do that stuff in school? Or oh, did yeah. You, did, you, did you always know you wanted to be in politics? Oh, absolutely. I've had an opinion from a very young age. So <laughs> well, if that shocks any of you, I'm surprised. There's a difference between having an opinion and being political, though. Did you That's always true. know that you wanted to be in politics specifically? You know, not in politics, but talking about politics. And a lot of people that are familiar with my story know where it comes from for me. I grew up in the Midwest, as we call it the flyover states. I call them forgotten Americans. And although more attention has been drawn to the forgotten Americans in the last couple of years, for me growing up, I would watch the nightly news and I felt like middle America was not represented. And I felt like when they would talk about school shootings, when they would talk about terrorism, when they would talk about agriculture or whatever it may be, they were neglecting the middle of the country and we didn't have much of a voice or a presence. So my goal was to change that and make sure that people knew what the forgotten American, the silent majority had to say. So that's where it started for me. So, so like as a teenager, you felt that your voice wasn't, that the, the issues in South Dakota weren't being discussed? Is that is that what you... You know, primarily I remember many times watching, my family watched ABC News constantly. That's what we watched. And I remember after every time there would be a shooting, they would be talking about the Second Amendment, they'd be talking about guns, and they'd be saying, oh, you know, they shot him with a deer rifle or this or that. And I remember thinking, I'm from South Dakota, I have a knowledge of guns, that's incorrect, that's incorrect. But I felt like people around the country were taking it, eating it up, and there was a lot of misinformation. But because nobody was challenging the narrative, because people challenge it a lot now. But back then, even though I'm only 26, even 10, 15 years ago, people weren't challenging it like they are today. Why do you think they talk about it that, in that way on ABC News? They are. I mean, Tom Rosal on NBC, when you were he's from South I know, but I think there's a lot of misinformation. I, I really do. I think that a lot of people that, a lot of people in news, with the exception of some that are from the Midwest, grow up in New York, or they grow up in LA, they grow up on the coasts. So that is their, conception of reality and it ends there. So they don't mean to maybe give you misinformation about guns or about rural America, but they do that by product of they don't know, they've never been to the middle, or if they do, they're flying over and they can't wait to get the hell out. That's what I saw. I'm from, I mean, I'm from North Carolina and I can understand in large part what you're talking about, that there are certainly pockets of the country where people have different views than they do in New York or LA. But is there is there an argument that those folks in the middle of the country also need to understand and appreciate the views of those folks from That's all we get. That's all we hear is the, the people from the coasts. That's really all there is out there. You don't see, I mean, I live in LA now, but even living in LA, everything is centered in DC and New York. So even being in LA, which is a huge city, a lot of times news doesn't even happen here or it's not covered here in much the way it is, especially on the East Coast. So the people in the middle, where where is the hub that they're having their news come from? Do you think there are a lot of conservatives in LA? No, I know there are. I know there are a lot of people. So you do live in LA for yes. a while now. Do you feel ostracized here in the city because of being a conservative? I'm gonna tell you this. I was in Minnesota and I had water thrown at me. So it doesn't matter where you are. Just water? Just water. Yeah, just water. <laughs> but I'm telling you, it doesn't matter where you are in this country, you're gonna face backlash and resistance from wherever you go because we live in an incredibly polarized environment. Yes, if I go to West Hollywood, the reception is not warm. Sometimes being even where I live in the South Bay, sometimes the reception is not warm. But I will say this for those of you out there because I like to give advice. I know there are a lot of young conservatives out there who feel like they can't speak their mind because they feel like there is nobody else that's like them, nobody else shares their opinion, and they're afraid. But I will tell you this, if you are vocal, you will find that there are so many people around you who are wishing that you would say something, wishing that there would be that first one that would come out and say, this is how I feel. Because then, you fixed everything, it hasn't, because we still have whisper voters. That's why the polls are always wrong. That's why they said Hillary had a 93% chance of winning, because people are not talking to the pollsters, they're not talking in surveys or to the local news or to bystanders, they're not saying, hey, I'm a conservative, I'm a Trump supporter. They're very quiet about it because they're living their daily lives, but they go out and vote. We need to change that, though, so that 
the people that are conservatives, Trump supporters on the right, or even in the middle, they feel like they can say what they need to say and be taken as seriously and as morally as the people on the left. Do you think there's a middle anymore? I do. I think most people do exist in the middle. I do think that we are middle to right in this country. I, I do. But I do think that there's a middle. Right now, though, what you're seeing is you're seeing those that are going to go out in the streets with their mega hats and try to antagonize people. And then you see people that are going to go out in the streets with their pink hats and try to antagonize people. But there's a group of people that exist in the middle who want tax breaks, who want a wall, who want to just live their daily lives in middle America. And, and those are their values. It's not Russia. It's not pink hats. It's not any of this. So who's speaking? Because I don't, I totally agree with all that. I mean, you and I don't have the same political views on a lot of things, sure. But, but I don't disagree with that at all. There's a lot of people who are in the middle. But when you see the media, no matter what channel you watch, is there someone that you can think of that's really speaking for the middle, for the, for the moderate voter who sometimes agrees with the right, sometimes agrees with the left? Is there someone who speaks like that? I don't think that sells as well, but I will tell you this, as someone who I work for Fox News that is considered by many to be on the right, and I'm very proud of the network that I work for, but I will tell you this, because I'm a conservative and I work for Fox News and I vote Republican on, on most issues and most causes, I'm very conservative, there are people that know very well that there are some issues that I don't stack up on the conservative checklist, and that's okay. We need to stop telling people that they're not liberal enough, they're not conservative enough, they're not gay enough, they're not straight enough, they're not white enough, they're not black enough. I'm so sick of that. I'm definitely gay enough. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what, so what issues would those be then that you are... Uh, that you don't necessarily consider yourself that you would stack up on that. On that, do you do you have people who attack you oh, for not being? I, I'll enough? tell you this. I've been attacked. I think almost equally by the left and the right by people that are at this very convention that are on the far right really? that attack me for some of the beliefs that like I have. Like well, I think many of you in this room know how I feel uh, when it comes to the pro-life, pro-choice debate. I mean, I lost my job over it, and I'm willing to go to bat for the things that I believe in, and that's one that I believe in. And it fit sometimes. It this narrative of you have to be this, you have to be that. I believe I'm a conservative. I believe in maximizing freedom. End of the day, I don't care what you do. I don't want the government to pay for it. So some people will look at me like she must be pro-life, she must be anti-gay. Couldn't be further from the truth. I believe in maximizing freedom for the American people. I believe Americans come first in our own country. Well, where does that where does that viewpoint have a place in the Republican Party, there because I mean, I'm gonna call you out a little bit. I wasn't planning on it, but I will because Megan McCain is one of my closest friends. And right after the day before her dad died, you were with Kelly Ward in Arizona and you said, We need to not elect these rhinos, you know. Yeah. And aren't there people who would call no, you here's, a the here's the difference it is okay if your beliefs don't fall on a checklist and you're very honest and forthright with that because I come out and say, Here's the area where I might deviate from your traditional conservative, and there are some areas in which I do, but I'm honest. What infuriates me is when you have politicians that are elected to office, that campaign on border security, they campaign on a balanced budget and tax cuts, and they go to D.C. and they do the opposite. That is a rhino. And yes, when we're campaigning in Arizona, I think Arizona deserves better. I believe John McCain was a great American, a brave man. No one can dispute that. He's a legend. However, the way he represented the people in Arizona, I think was a disservice to the people of Arizona. I think that they deserve better. And as you saw with Jeff Flake, they deserve better. It came, also came at a time when it was a primary battle that was very important for the state of Arizona. Right, but aren't there, I mean, I guess what, what com is conflicting to me is that I would certainly agree that there are some Republicans, I can say there are Republicans who I have a lot of respect for, and usually they're the people who are very honest about where they stand. And I think Senator McCain was honest about where he stood and, and, and pretty much came very clean about how he felt about the process. Do you think there are Demo any Democrats who you trust at all in the center of the house right now who sometimes vote with their party, sometimes don't, but are always honest about their positions? I think to say that there are no Democrats that I respect, that's that's not true at all. I didn't I, say that. Yeah. I, 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 I will worried. say, you know, there are some and I think that the Democratic Party, to be quite honest, I think that there are more Democrats that are level headed out there, but they don't get the chance. Because you have people like Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, you have people like Maxine Waters, Nancy Pelosi, and they are the face of the Democratic Party. That's a disservice. People like Connor Lamb don't get attention because they are more moderate, and they're not going to get the light of day shown on them because they're not the ones that are out there being radical. And that, to me, 
if, you're, if the Democrats were smart, they'd change that in a hurry. If, if, if a conservative can argue that people on the far, far right of their party don't necessarily speak for the vast majority of Republicans, people on the fringes of the, of the party don't necessarily speak for the vast majority of Republicans, isn't it, isn't it fair to believe that many Democrats have to think that people on the far left of their party don't necessarily speak for them? But they're not being vocal about it. They're still putting Hillary Clinton out doing interviews. They still have Barack Obama campaigning in California. I personally am not putting anyone anywhere. You know, the media is placing <laughs> people, you, people have that. saying that that's who they're giving the airtime to. Because the Democratic Party, if they wanted to change it, they would stop uplifting people like Cory Booker and Nancy Pelosi and Hillary Clinton. And they'd get them to listen to the party. They don't want to do that. Are people like that on the Republican side who you wish would get less airtime? Well, I think that being in the Republican Party now is very interesting because it's very hard to compete with Donald Trump. So, Donald yeah. Trump's going to get the airtime. There are not a lot of Republicans out there that are getting the airtime because if you're going to talk about a conservative Republican issue, most likely it's going to be Donald Trump himself talking about it. But do you, are there, I mean, there are things that he has said or done that you have not agreed with? Is that fair to say? I think we can all say that sometimes he's tweeted things where he's taking a step back and like, oh, do I like that, do I not? At the end of the day, it's about getting stuff done for me. And I'm going to be, I've said this before, I wish that instead of talking about Kanye West and talking about Rod Rosenstein and talking about Russia and a witch hunt, I wish we could focus on things like building a wall. Yes, I have those questions. Because I think the other, this, this dog and pony show, I think it's a distraction. I think that if Republicans want to win, if Donald Trump wants to win, we focus on the accomplishments that are concrete. Enough with the circus. Enough with talking about all these things that don't impact average Americans. The way that my, my litmus test for most of the things that I do is if I can look at a family in the Midwest who's struggling to pay their mortgage, that's struggling to put their kids through school, I ask myself, how is this going to impact that person? If it doesn't impact their daily life at all, why are we spending so much time talking about it? Well, it's because it sells. Okay, now, now I'm going to say, because we sent questions to you so that you could, because this is not a contentious thing at all. Um, but one of the sections was pop culture, and the first question is, what do you think of Kanye West meeting at the White House? And you said, love this section. So I it's do. something you want to talk about, and Absolutely. you think it's important anyway. Um, so tell me, what do you think of the whole sure. Kanye West thing? Well, first let me say that I think that any time someone, an American with a platform, comes out and they support their president, I think that's great. We should all support our president. How do that? However, I will say this. Conservatives now... And I'm, I'm a part of the what we may term the new conservative movement or the young conservative movement. Here is my fear. My fear is that too many young conservatives now are attaching themselves to personalities and not ideas. And I would be the first to say, don't attach yourself to me. I'm a messenger. Don't attach yourself to me. I am not the future of your movement. I am a voice in it. Donald Trump is not the future of the movement. He's a voice in it. Kanye West, sure as hell, is not the voice for the movement. He's just someone who has placed himself in it. So when people attach themselves, to people like Kanye West, and I'm sorry, when he goes in and he, he's supposed to be representative of conservative values and he goes on a rambling tirade and then afterwards he goes to an Apple store and rants on a table, to me, that is not what I want to say that's the face of our movement because it makes it look bad. And then I, I always caution people too, what's going to happen six months down the road when the man does something completely unhinged? goes off the handle, then are conservatives still going to sit there and be like, don't tread on ye? I'm like, no, they're not. They're not. They're going to say, uh-oh, maybe we shouldn't have attached ourselves to him because maybe he's not incredibly stable. And I think we can all look at that and say, I appreciate you supporting your president. I appreciate that you're coming out and you're challenging the left and you're challenging the box that you've been placed in. That's great. My beef isn't with Kanye West. Kanye West is getting attention, which is what Kanye West wants. My issue is with conservatives that are latching onto it and saying, oh boy, guys, this is how we're going to get Trump elected in 2020. Because I'll say this, if, if unhinged celebrities and their endorsements mattered, Hillary Clinton would be your president. Wow. If, if you're afraid of the personality being the, the driving force behind people voting, do you, would you... Agree at all with the argument that that's a lot of what the president, the current president, Trump has had. People him. love him because he 
pushes back. But at the same time, you can't just push back and, and be empty on the rest of your promises. The thing I love about this president, and not only I, do I like the way he combats the media because I think it's interesting and I think it's funny to watch him push back and I love to watch them lose their minds over it. At the end of the day, though, if he was doing nothing, if he was doing all of that, he was just out attacking the media on Twitter, I wouldn't be a Trump supporter. The reason I'm a Trump supporter is the agenda, which is America first. It's tax cuts, it's Americans, it's immigration reform. And you know what? I'm, I'm mad as hell that we don't have a wall that's being built at a more rapid rate. I'm mad as hell about that. My president needs to do that because that's what he promised the American people. Now it's not all his fault. Congress doesn't give him the money that he needs to do it, but with someone with a platform like Donald Trump has, boy, I wish he would put their feet to the fire and say, if you're going to run on border security enforcement, when you get to D.C., you better sure as well do it because they're not. And we're giving them a pass. You were giving the president a pass, you're saying? No, we're giving Republicans a pass. I see Republicans all over this country that are campaigning so hard for midterms right now and they're campaigning on border enforcement. But they're the same ones that have been campaigning on border enforcement for years. And they get there, and they don't do it. They talk about it. They go back and forth. Oh, we can't get money for a wall. Maybe we can do this. Maybe we can do that. We never get to where we need to so, go. So do they deserve to be reelected? Uh, I would rather, to me, electing someone that stands there as a Republican and doesn't go in and enact conservative Republican values and, and things like the wall, things like tax cuts, balancing the budget, national security, then no, they don't deserve to be. And I hope we have a new crop of people that come up like we saw in 2010, and I hope that they come up and say, no, no, we're tired of this. We need to drain the swamp on both sides. But when an incumbent gets voted out, it's, it's news, right? Mm -hmm. Eric Hanner got voted out um, yes, in his have. primary, but, it, and it, but it's news because it doesn't happen very often. It's very rare. So we're in, a, we're in an election year now. Um, most states have finished their primaries. I think maybe there might be one or two left. But most of the incumbents, Republicans, have maintained hold of their nomination. Do you, do you still feel that those same Republicans shouldn't be reelected if they've not been doing what you want them to do? I think we need, it's such a tricky time right now because I think that we need to make sure we're holding on to the House and the Senate because that's the only way we're going to get things done. However, it hasn't done, it hasn't done much for you yet, though, right? I, I would say we need to hold it. However, cautionary tale to those Republicans that are going to sit here and campaign on the coattails of Donald Trump and get there and do nothing. There are some great ones coming up, um, Marshall Blackburn being one that I have a tremendous faith in, and, and many others that I think are going to enact America first. But to those that are going to get there and do nothing, your days are limited. You might have got through this election, but you just wait. We're going to give you another chance because we need to hold it. But if you go there and we control the House and the Senate and the presidency and you still do nothing, the American people are going to turn on you. How do you feel about, how do you feel about Joe Manchin? In, in what sense? Well, I mean, as, as a, he's a senator now. He's the senator from West Virginia. It looks like he's on track for re-election. Is that something that upsets you? Um, is that something, do, do you feel that he's, he's not effective for the people of his state? You know, I have, you have to ask people of West Virginia because they know more closely than I do. I'm not going to let you give that as the answer. you got to give me your opinion. Yeah, I, I, I don't know enough about what he's doing for the people of his state to comment on But he's a Democrat. Yeah, he's and, a Democrat. And him being there keeps... Democrats gives Democrats one more vote, which potentially could propel them into the majority if, if enough Democrats get elected. But he votes with the Republicans a lot. A lot of Democrats don't like him. I guess I maybe the question is, are the they moderates? I mean, you you say there's that a lot of people are moderates. North Dakota as well, and there are many right. who are who are Democrats who. She's had a little more hard day than yeah. he is, but yeah. but. But moderates, if we're, if we're talking so much about, and you've said it, and I agree with you, about so many people living in the middle, yeah. why don't we have more politicians who are there as well? Why is it that you want Republicans like Marsha Blackburn, who are further to the right, than a person like Phil Bredesen, who appeals to the people in the middle? I think the problem is that we are too focused on left and left versus right. To me, it's America first. And I said this to a lot of my friends. If Cory Booker was standing out there talking about building a wall, talking about tax breaks, talking about America first, I would vote for Cory, Cory Booker. It makes no difference who it is. It's America first. And it's unfortunate that it's we've come to a time where issues of the right are border enforcement and tax cuts, and the issues of the left are what? Hating Trump? Marching? Protesting? What, what is America? What is, what is American? American. Yeah, just define that. America, to me, American is, is freedom. America first is putting the people of the United States of America first. And that means border. That means we're looking at that. That means Americans be able to keep more of what they earn. I don't trust government. I don't want to make it bigger. 
I mean, I know we're going to get to California later, but when we talk about America first, we talk about trade deals that are going to benefit Americans. We talk about the things that everyday Americans, they, they struggle with and they need help with. And having more of their own tax dollars in their pockets and not being sent to D.C. and blowing in the wind, I think that's, that's a huge one. And that shouldn't be a left versus right, but unfortunately that's what it's become. But it isn't necessarily, it hasn't necessarily always been owned by Donald Trump's Republican Party. I mean, trade and trade reform mm -hmm. was a big part of Bernie Sanders' uh, platform as well. And a lot of those trade reform policies would, would have been liberal at one point. What, what is Donald Trump doing to your party with, in regard to trade and his populist message? And some of the things that he's talked about, like infrastructure and spending on infrastructure, um, the fact that the deficit has increased instead of gone down under his leadership, are those not essentially liberal? They would have been liberal well, I mean, policies let's for you. be honest, Donald Trump for most of his life probably would be considered a liberal in a lot of ways. And that doesn't bother you? No, it doesn't, because it's, it's not about whether you say you're a liberal, you're a conservative, or no, I don't care what you say that you are. It's about what you're going to do when you get there. And yes, Donald Trump is finally holding people accountable that need to be held accountable, China being one. And yes, now we have a new trade agreement. I have issues with the new trade agreement. I think it's a step in the right direction, but there are issues I've had with it that I'm vocal about. So it's not a matter of, oh, it's perfection, but we're moving in a direction that helps Americans. And that is undeniable. When you, when you look at the economy, it's chugging along, it's growing. GDP, Obama said it was never going to get over 4%. What are we sitting close to 4.2 at this point? Those are things that impact real Americans. And that, and that you believe, has been a part of it, has been the cause. Let me try that one more time. You believe the cause of that has been some of this trade reform policy, renegotiating NAFTA, that type of thing? Some of that tax, tax bill is a big one. Like I said, a tax cut for 80% of Americans will receive a tax cut because of Donald Trump. So, and then deregulation. There's been so much deregulation, people don't realize how that impacts their, impacts their pocketbook or impacts the way that their, the government spends, but it does. So, I mean, if you look at just the paper and you look at just the numbers, it's difficult even for a, for a progressive who voted for Hillary Clinton, like me, to deny that there are tangible differences today in the economy than there were two years ago. Why then has the president's approval rating not reflected that? The president's approval rating, I believe, it is pretty still stable. underwater. But it, it, I mean, but, like I said but, again, but, but I'm, I'm stop, not I'm I stopped believing. I stopped believing in polls when like I told you. Oh, we all believe in polls me. when they agree with us. No, I, 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 I stopped believing in polls when I heard that Hillary had a 93 percent chance of winning on election day. They, they said that. So I, when you, again, I'm talking about the whisper voter. So the polls and the you can, okay. The poll I'm gonna run this, not you. Um, the, uh, but no, I, listen, I'm, I'm conceding that you're right. And some people, don't like Trump. some people don't like Trump because he's mean. If Democrats would get over the fact that Donald Trump is mean, right. and that was the center of their argument, but it has to be the center of their what argument because they have nothing else. Well, I guess, I guess, listen, I'm a white male in, in America. I'm a gay male, which kind of makes me a part of a minority, but I'm not a minority race. I'm not a female. I've got white privilege. And so it's it's okay. easier. You've you got to tell me, Kelly. I'm not, I'm not going out no, 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 no. Listen, you trust me. I ain't got. I ain't scared of y'all sons of bitches at all. I know. Don't you I don't care. Care. women saying like we need women's rights and I often ask women they're like women's rights and I say what rights don't you have because I feel like I have a right and you say you use the right privilege my white privilege checked with a woman male last month I don't know when your are listen I lost American Idol to a black man so I should hate him but I don't but my point is Um, but I do recognize that when I walk down the street in New York City, I'm not. When I see a police officer, I'm not afraid. And I do recognize that there are a lot of there are a lot of people in this country who do see certain situations and recognize that they may be in your But but and then we'll get back to the other stuff. But I mean, there is a disconnect here. You you. 
disagree with me here. Okay, and, I'm going to say this because I want to touch on that because people that know me, they know when we talk about when we talk about law enforcement, you're hitting a, a button with me that's really hard to unhit. I'm not. I know you're not. Before you start I'm making this about me attacking It's not. Me. I know it's not. But when you said that there are some people that walk down the street because they're of color that they fear police officers, you know, I'm not going to discount anybody's way anybody feels or the way anybody perceives people looking at them because that's not my place to do it. But I will say this. When I was in Dallas and there was a shooting of five officers that were targeted because they were white officers, the other officers that were in the street that were both white and black, when they were getting people out of the way, they didn't care if they were getting a black man out of the way, a Hispanic man out of the way, a white woman out of the way, a gay man out of the way. Those police officers responded and they take care of their community because that's their duty and their job. And I will say, if So, so let, let's, let me ask you this, because what that brings up to me is the lack of nuance, right? Because I didn't say there was anything wrong with a police officer. I've got several immediate family members who are police officers, and, and I support the work that they do, and I support the work that 99.9% .9 of police officers in this country do. And I think, though, that most people do. And so my issue was not necessarily that police officers are dangerous and that police officers are out to try to hurt people of color. My, my point was, you asked me about white privilege, my point was specifically that there are people for whom they have a fear, they have a fear when they, when they encounter you know someone. What I think, but I want to ask you. I want to tell you this, because this is very important to me, and I'm going to let it go. When you say that, I feel like a lot of that, when, when, when people of color are on the, on the street and they're walking across the street and they say, I feel inherently uncomfortable, or I feel like I'm being watched, I feel like I'm being mistrusted, I feel like the police are maybe looking at me differently or they're maybe out to get me. I'm not going to take away from the feeling they're feeling because that is their feeling to own. However, I will say this, how much of that came from their family members telling them they couldn't trust police, don't go to police, they're out to get you. And that's I think a lot of people would, would draw that from draw that opinion from those from that experience. But I think a lot of people now I ain't got a problem kicking some of y'all asses out of here. So so seriously, if you came to listen to Tommy's opinion, that's what you're gonna get. I'm not here to argue with her, although I am right now a little bit. But 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 I don't think anybody I don't think anybody paid for a ticket to hear your ass talk. Okay? So Let me ask you, though, so that we, so we get off sure. the, the debate thing, and, and say, do you feel like, because I think that that argument itself, and a lot of the other ones in this country, when it comes to the differences that we have, come from, you know what, I'm not going to give my opinion, I'm going to ask you, do you think there is a lack of empathy in politics? When we're dealing with a soundbite culture, perhaps, but I think that politics and media I think that in politics and media, we appear far more divided than we truly are in our communities. Because that's what sells and that's what plays well. They're not playing the, the people in communities that are helping each other after Hurricane Michael, black people, white people, Republicans, Democrats. They're not playing that as much on TV, but they are playing, oh, so-and-so got this. And even myself, it's like, they won't put me on TV because I have water thrown at me. You know, like there are so many more important things. Like that's what people want to see. They want to see the guy in the mega hat getting punched and then, one network wants to say this, and another that network wants to say that's because that's what people like. They like the, the guts and the gore, and they like people trashing Donald Trump's sign on the Walk of Fame. And it's unfortunate that that gets the attention. Do you, I mean, one of the questions this morning for the college debates was, um, and I'm not going to get it exactly right because my memory's horrible, but it, the, essentially the debate was between said political discourse, um, no, I'm sorry, political polarization is the most dangerous thing affecting our country right now. Do you think that's true? Do you think there's something else that's more dangerous? I think an open, unenforced border is most dangerous. It's more dangerous than political violence. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as much as, as, much as like, Miley Yiannopoulos might hurt your feelings, the drug cartel coming across the border, that's more dangerous than my feelings. Put your hand up if, you, if you're one of those people who, who are here because you disagree with Tommy. I'll put mine up for now just to be, you know, just say, now, leave your hand up. If you're willing to change your mind by the end of this um, this meeting, really, y'all are full of shit. <laughs> I mean, but that's kind of the truth, right? Don't you feel like there are less people who are willing to change their mind? I love forums like this. 
and this is why I love it because I'm in my just finishing writing a book now, and it's not even political in, in most cases. But what I talk about is when you have to spend time with me one on one. It doesn't matter if it was Chelsea Handler last year, if it was Joy Behar on The View, or if it's the conservative friends that I surround myself with that work at my network. Nobody has ever been in a situation with me one on one where they walked away and said that girl's a bitch because I'm not. And I'm a nice person, and I might disagree with you, but at the end of the day, I have friends that are liberal that voted for Hillary. And you know what? I love them just as much as my friends that wear mega hats. Right, so, and we have that in our personal life. Because I'm the mega hats are one of my best friends, I'm, and, and right. I have nothing but nice things to say about you, right? But I don't know that you'll change my mind right here, and I don't know that I'll change yours if we were to, to get into debate. Do you think that that's a problem, the fact that we're... Or do you think that people are less willing to actually listen and form their opinions once speaking to someone who they disagree with? Or do you think we've all made, our, made up our minds and we're in our trials and we're on our teams and we're not moving? I think we need to change that. I always tell people, don't exist in an echo chamber. I actually asked this, I did a, a speaking thing last December, and I had the, it was all a conservative audience, it was a conservative college group, and I said, raise your hand if your friends are all conservative. And they were all like, oh, my friends are conservative, that's a problem. Because if all of your friends think the same way, they're not challenging you, and you need to, you need to go beyond that, you need to have friends that think differently, friends that challenge you, friends that... I have a lot of friends that are conservative that are adamantly pro-life, and we can have discussions about it, and we can know when it's not a good time to have a discussion. We need to have that, and I would encourage everyone to be able to separate the person from the politics and get to know them as a human being. <laughs> conservative outlets were like, oh, was she horrible, was she this? I'm like, no, she wasn't. We disagreed, but she's not a horrible person. Same note, I've had conservatives that have been so vile and rude to me, one-on-one -on -one and on social media, and I would not count them as a friend. I would count Chelsea Handler as a friend more so than I would people that agree with 99% of the things I say. Do you think that, do you think that social media has made it worse, though? Oh, absolutely. Because I have the same experience. I think we've all had the same experience. I, I would imagine most people here have a friend or a family member who has a different political view than they do. And when we have one-on-one -on -one discussions, we can agree to disagree, but we don't hate each other. Social media has made that more difficult. Why is that permeating in Congress, for example? Why is that issue still in D.C. when people are right in front of each other and they are... Can we be honest? No, I want you to lie to us. <laughs> yes! The, the reason that I think that that is, I think that politicians now want to be Donald Trump, and they want to be on TV, and they want to be stars, and they want to be Cory Booker, Spartacus out there getting the attention. I think that's what Emma left in the right. I think that politicians now, instead of serving the people, want to be on TV. And Donald Trump started out on TV, and now he's trying to help the country, and yes, he is still, at the end of the day, he is still Donald Trump, he's gonna be Donald Trump. But we've got people now that have no business trying to be celebrities, but that is their primary goal, is like, I wonder how outrageous I can be so that I, they can replay the sound bite of me a hundred times. It's unfortunate. Politics is entertainment, the entertainment industry for ugly people. That's what I was, that's what I was told. Now, you're, you're in entertainment and not politics. You're clearly hot today, so it's not you. But let's be honest, it is. There's no more dangerous place in D.C. than between Chuck Jr. and a camera. Um, do I? I'm going to move on to a few other things. It is, I mean, let's, 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 let's move on to some other issues, because you've had, there have been some hot button issues for you. Immigration is one of them. You want the wall. Um, do you think we'll get the wall? We better get the wall. I think we're going to get the wall if the people in this room, the people that are voting, mandate that we get a wall like they did in 2016. And so far, they've been failed. But I think we will get one. I think that that What's is... What's stopping us from getting it? I know you say Republicans, but is there a specific faction that's making it difficult? Well, the problem is people don't want to fund the wall. When it comes time to vote on it and fund it, they don't want to do it. Because, like I believe, they don't actually want a wall. They don't actually want border enforcement. They want to keep talking about it, talking about it, so that they don't have to do anything about it, so that they're, they're not vulnerable. Because when someone steps out and says, I'm voting for the wall, then they're like, oh, push back, I don't know, I got what are the poll numbers, what, are the, what is the feeling of the people, instead of going there and saying, this is what I'd like to do, I believe in the wall, let's do it. They don't want to make any decision.
because then they can just volley it around for generations. Is there a better way that you think it should be framed that would make people more understand? Is, 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 is the message right now, I think, for conservatives who like the law, it, that message is working. You have plenty of people who clap when you talk about the law. But for people in the middle and people on the left, they hear the law and they think, this is just about racism. Do you, do you ever is there notice that people that think that it's racist and people that hate the symbolism of the wall? Do you ever notice it's those people that don't have to live near the border? They live in gated communities. They don't have to worry about it. There are jobs that are secure. You have people that hate the wall that are celebrities that are wealthy, that have security, that are never going to have to live in communities where there are illegal immigrants, that are never going to have to worry about sanctuary cities affecting them. They're never going to have to worry about their, their jobs being taken or their jobs being given to somebody else. They, they don't have to worry about it. So it's easy for them to be like, the wall is mean, because it doesn't impact well, them. I don't, I don't notice that, no. And but, um, they also, they also want because to I think there are plenty of people in, in, in plenty of border areas that are against it. If there's a different talking point, and I said, and I said backstage that one of the things I like about you is you don't tend to stick on talking points. Right. But the talking points for the wall have not worked in two years because Democrats haven't changed their minds, and a certain chunk of Republicans have not come all the way over to it yet either. So how can it be sold in a better way, or is it just keep pushing the same message? Do you think that there's a do you think that there's a better thing, a better way that the president or those who support it could? position that might make it more tenable or palatable to people who don't like it. I think that if we start realizing truly what's coming over here, and I always say it all the time because the, a lot of the argument that I hear from the left, and I think it's, it's well-meaning, is they say, you know what, America's a great country, I agree. People want to come over here because they want a better life, they want more opportunities, I agree. If I wasn't an American, I sure as hell would want to be one. But I can tell you this. The way that it is right now, as we're seeing with Mexico funneling other people over here because they don't, they don't want them. They want to funnel them on over the United States, right? So people don't realize that those individuals that are coming over illegally, whether they're coming over to try to claim asylum, a lot of those claims never go through because their the merits are not met. A lot of the people think, well, they're just good people that just want to come over here and be Americans, and they may very well may be because let's be honest, a lot of these people are good people. They're hardworking people. There are people that we would welcome into our country with open arms if they did it the right way. But those people, even if they are coming over with their families to escape persecution or wherever it may be, they are still funding criminal organizations by coming over here because they are still paying coyotes. They are still paying traffickers thousands of dollars to get them here. So you're never going to make these countries better because illegal immigration is not only harming the United States, it's harming the countries that they're from because now the criminal organizations are very well funded and that's a spigot that's never going to be shut off until people stop paying the criminal organizations to get over here illegally. That is why a wall, when we look at a wall, it's not just like keep everyone out. It's a wall because when you have a physical barrier, it works. Yes, then people have to come through the right way because there's not as many areas where they can sneak through. I've been to the border. I've seen areas where scouts sit on the other side of the hill, on their side of the border, and they look and they wait, and it's an open area. There is nothing there, or maybe there's some twigs tied together with barbed wire. And they look and they wait for Border Patrol not to be there, and they cross people over. And so if there were a wall there, with the camera and the technology that we have, Border Patrol would much more easily be able to identify those people that are coming over illegally and the scouts that are being paid, by the way, by cartel and criminal organizations. They would better be able to spot those people and keep those people from coming in illegally because barriers work. Anytime you're trying to keep, even in this room, if this room was just a free-for-all, then everybody that wanted to come in here and attack me could just come in, right? But because we have that only open door, that means that if someone wants to come in here, they have to go through that door. And you can better protect one door than you could if this whole thing was open. That is the law.
maybe they will divert themselves. We're but but I ask you, is there, are, there is a lot of, there, I believe there's more illegal immigration coming from the north than there is coming from the and south. Have and it's coming. And you know what is coming through as well? There's a huge issue right now in Miami and Puerto Rico. They have huge yeah, like how much, how big is this wall can't go the whole damn way you around, what? you know? But that's the thing is Air and Marine, because I spent time with Border Patrol and I spent time with Air and Marine units that are now in that area and they don't have, their manpower is like a hundred people to guard and protect that whole area. So you are able, if you do have it, let's be honest, the southern border is the primary issue. And it has been. But if you can then have a barrier there, then you can reallocate resources. Then if you start seeing a problem at the northern border, then the thing about it is, though, is that Mexico is much more compliant with illegal immigrants passing through than Canada Are there is. other countries that are like that? Other countries that are complicit? I, they're complicit with... In, with this immigration with, issue. Well, I think that... You're saying, I mean, you said... I think I mean, you I mean, you didn't use the word complicit idea. They, they, they affect us direct, more directly. Yes, Mexico, we know. We've seen a caravan come Are there other countries mountain. that you feel are not doing a good job of helping diminish... I think Canada could do a better job, but when we're talking about what our issues are and our priorities, I think the southern border clearly is of greater importance, at least now. And you know what? If we have an issue in the northern border, we're going to have to address that, too. But if you can get a wall in the southern border, you can reallocate your resources, your border control, your technology on the northern border. And a lot of people also don't realize that in, in, in protecting our northern border is, in a lot of ways, a lot easier because you're not dealing with what we're seeing now with the migrant caravans. Maybe someday will it be a problem like that? Perhaps. So people are coming usually from the deep of the heart of Canada and coming through to the United States. It's just not what we're seeing. When the president says things like shithole countries and we want more people from places like Norway, do you think that, that is true? That was proven that he said that, first of all. Well, okay, he, said, he may have said Well, let's not pretend he ain't, he's, everything he's ever said has been perfectly accurate right. and, and sunshiny. So I guess the real question is, does he make it more difficult for himself by saying certain things like that, do you think? Yeah, I don't think that, I mean, he didn't say that at a rally. He said that behind closed doors and stuff. And, but I mean, yeah, did he say it and a lot of Americans like cheer for it because it's kind of funny? Like, yeah, I mean, that's our president. He says the things that he says. Does it ruffle the feathers of Democrats? Absolutely. But what does Donald Trump say that doesn't ruffle the feathers well, of the Democrats? You're not wrong about that. But I think that goes back to, and I don't want to keep digging into it, but it goes back to this polarization and what can be done to fix it. Because you're right. You're right. You're right. There are a lot of folks who will say liberal, a lot of liberals yeah. who no, he'll never do anything right for. But there are also a lot of conservatives for whom Obama could never do anything right. And and is there a solution? I mean, Politicon is one of the few times that people actually come together from different places. And this year, more than any, yeah, you can clap for that. But but this year, as a matter of fact, this is my fourth year doing it, and this is the first year where the organizers of the event found that conservatives would not be on stage with Democrats, and Democrats would not be on stage with certain conservatives because they didn't want to be associated with them. And that's, you know, I think, yeah, I think that's horrible. We all think that's horrible. But how does that, I mean, it's getting worse. How does it, how do we fix that polarization? Nobody seems to want to talk to each other or be seen to even talk to each other. I think it's, it's, a, it's a top down thing. I mean, Donald Trump has already said, how many times has he reached out to the other side and wanted to have discussions? Yes, there is a problem with political polarization. I'm not going to fix it, you're not going to fix it, but what I will say with my messaging is I don't hang out with all conservatives. All my thoughts are not filling a checklist of what a conservative should be. I think for myself, I have the rare ability to upset both the left and the right and take great pride in that. I would encourage everybody that came here because they hate me, I would encourage them to really think deep down, do you really hate me or do you disagree with me? Because those are very different things. And so we need to fix it and we can fix it if we start having conversations with each other. And it's gonna take smaller groups like this to start doing it, but I'm hoping that that's gonna spread. What infuriates me, Clay, and I have to be honest, and it's, it's my own movement and my own party a lot of times, is I see people, again, this whole thing that's like they want to be celebrities and they want to be famous, and so they go out and they antagonize people to try to get a reaction with their damn phone out because they want to record a liberal attacking them so that they can get on and talk about it on the morning shows across the networks. That, to me, is despicable and it's disgusting because I don't go out, when I go to the airport or whatever else, I don't go out, like, people know where I stand on the issues, but I don't go out and try to antagonize people and get in people's faces and be like, oh, Donald Trump, Donald Trump, because I know that I'm putting myself in a precarious situation, and I don't want to be in that position, and I don't want to cause a scene. I do what I do, and I do it in, in my work, and I do it on stages like this. I do it on Twitter. I do it on social media, but I don't try to sit there and go up in people's faces and just be an asshole just for the benefit of being an asshole and getting it on my phone. I think that there's such a problem with that. 
we're gonna we're gonna put a we're gonna put the, well, the microphone is out there. We're gonna let people come before you stand up. Before you stand up, let me just say we don't have too much time now. I know I'm a, I'm a Oscar on you, okay? Because you've been a little bit crazy. Um, don't come up. Don't come up and just make a comment, okay? We we let's assume that everybody's here because they love Tommy or they disagree with Tommy. I'm here because I love her now. Didn't know her very well before, but I do think she's been delightful. So if you're just gonna come up, so if you're just gonna come up and tell me you disagree with her, keep your ass in your seat, please. Okay? So if you have a question, if you have a question, then come up. I'll follow you in a second. Um, but let's let's keep it to questions. Um, and if you have a question about a topic we haven't touched because I didn't get to everything, sorry. Yeah. Um, then then that would be ideal. So we'll get to as many as we can. Go. Hi. Uh, this is a topic we haven't discussed. Okay. Um, so the Trump administration is moving to exclude transgender people from civil rights protections, defining gender as either male or female, unchangeable and determined by the genitals that a person is born with. So my question is, do you support this move? And if so, how does this support your earlier definition that America is a country that represents freedom? Thank you. Well, I, again, where I stand on that issue, as far as that's concerned, I've talked about transgender issues a lot. Some areas where I'm like, do what you want, I don't care, and then other areas when it pertains to the military, I'm very outspoken in that regard. I think there's more nuance than just, oh, Trump wants transgenders to be attacked in the streets. I think that there's a little bit more to it than that when we're talking about protections and classifications. So this also is another thing that I love when people say, it's like, oh, Trump wants to let the mentally ill buy guns. It's like, there's more to it than that. There's more to it than just saying, oh, you just, no protections for transgender people. I, I think that there's more to it than the, the soundbite of the tagline that you're giving me. So we don't have time for follow-ups, so you'll have to just trust me to do one. Thank you very much for your question. Once you've asked your question, you can go sit down. But I will follow up on that. So there, there was a period uh, a year or so ago when the military had, Dr. Secretary Mattis had decided that transgenders would be uh, allowed in the military, and then Trump and then President Trump canceled that out, right? Did you have a, re have a reaction to that? Did you no, feel like he wasn't trusting his military? No, I'll, I'll tell you this. Um, because I, a lot of my friends are in the military, I speak to a lot of people who are in the military, I will tell you this. I have no issue with, with gays in the military whatsoever. Um, however, there is something to be said about those people that are transitioning or going through a transition and the hormones that they're on and the military readiness and how that factors in. There are a lot of things that, again, in the transgender community, the rate of suicide is incredibly high. It's also incredibly high in the active duty, in the veteran community. And you mix those two, military readiness suffers as a result. So it's not a matter of saying, oh, you're transgender, we don't want you here. It's a matter of saying, is this going to impact military readiness? Can you not go out because you're on hormone treatment therapy? Is the military now going to pay for your transition? Those are other factors beyond just, oh, we don't want to be by them. But if General, Mattis, if General Mattis came out and made, and made the statement that they would accept it, you have to assume that the military had factored that in. Is, does it concern you that the president didn't listen to his Secretary of Defense or his military leaders? I think there's a lot of political leaders. pressures on Mattis, and I'm not someone who, uh, although I believe James Lord, Mattis I, is a great, I think James Mattis is pretty he's a great leader. unpolitical. He's a great leader, but I will say this, there's been a lot of pressures within the military community, and those that are in the military can attest to this, there's been a lot of pressures as far as women in combat, women training for special operations that they have done because public opinion has overtaken military readiness, mission effectiveness in a lot of areas. And I sit here as a woman and say, should we have two women try to be Navy SEALs and then change the whole dynamic of special operations and change the whole training rituals and change the military effectiveness? No. No. Because at the end of the day, people forget that the military is not like other jobs. The same thing with law enforcement. It's not like other jobs. So whereas having transgenders serving in other areas or doing this or doing that is not as impactful is in that situation where you're in combat or where you have to deploy or you have to be ready and you have to be effective. That is why I don't think that they're right now, and I agree with Donald Trump in reversing that for transgenders in the military. Come on up. I'm watching you though. Okay. Uh, that's on me. I'm kind of starstruck because I'm a big fan of yours. But, uh, oh, thank you. Uh, uh, my name is Alex. Uh, I just graduated from Cal State Northridge, and I'm going to Santa Clara Law School. Me, me, like yourself, I'm from middle California, which is different from LA and San Francisco, so we tend to be more Republican and stuff like that. But, anyways, um, my question for you is, why do you think that um, people in the left, leftist media can say whatever they want and not have any consequences? Like, for example, when Joy Behar say that, uh, that uh, Christians were mentally ill, she didn't get a lot of, ABC didn't suspend her, she just apologized, nothing happened to her. But when Rosen and other people say 
other stuff. So, like, you have everyone like on their asses. So my question is like, why is it? Why is it that they don't get penalized like conservatives do? I mean, we all make mistakes. Well, but we got the question. I'm gonna, I, 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 I'll cut you off. But she so got it. Was her day. She, no, I got it. In, in a lot of areas, the reason that that is, of course, I've got a microphone that. too, though, and I'll <laughs> speak whatever the fuck I want to. Thank you. Very much. I'm just telling you, yes, I mean, is there a double standard in media and in Hollywood? Absolutely, because who's calling the shots there? There's a lot of liberals that are calling the shots. That's why you say, well, why are conservatives more censored on Twitter and Instagram and, and Facebook than con conservatives are more censored than liberals and lefts? Because look at who's controlling it. However, I will say this. We can bitch and we can moan about it. The best thing that we can do is we can band together and say, guess what? We have voices to be heard as well, and we're not going to take it anymore because we vote, we buy, we go on Facebook, we go on Instagram, we make them money, we, in all the areas, we watch TV. Look what happened with Last Man Standing. They tried to can that too, and guess what? It's back. Because if you want to, you can make your voice be heard. We don't do things like fairness doctrines, conservatives, we don't do that. We let the people decide, and if there's a demand for it, and if there's a change to be made, we make it happen. Do you think the way cops work? Thank you very much. Yeah. Do you think the way cops work? Quite honestly, I, when people do that, when they burn their, their stuff, and I, I don't believe in that. I mean, you already bought it, so you're burning your... I'm not gonna, I, am I going to buy a new Nike now? No, probably not because I don't like the message, but I'm not going to go burn the Nike stuff that I already own. I mean, that's ludicrous. I think that in some areas, boycotts are effective, but I also don't like when people call for people to be fired and all this because I've been through it, and I, I don't think that that mob mentality is effective, and I don't think that it's something that I would be a part of, at least. Hi, what up? Um, I'm, I'm starstruck. I've always thought you're super cool, and it's kind of a personal question, but I was wondering, Mr. Aiken, will you ever do a song that's a spiritual sequel to Invisible? <sighs> Someone talk. Um, probably not. Next, I'm gonna go to the next question, because this is this is the Tommy Larratown novel. Oh, not what I mean. Like, well, I appreciate it. Next, next year, we'll do a town hall where I, where I talk about Invisible. But, but today, I'll let you go smoke another one. Hi there. I've been trying to get this out really fast. I don't want to take up too much of you and your fans' time. So hopefully I can get it out without being interrupted. That'd be great. Uh, my name's Alyssa McNerney. If you don't know me, I am, uh, do a political channel right now. Final Facts with Alyssa. You may also know me, Tommy, because you literally made an entire Final uh, Thoughts segment about me February 2017. You decided to criticize uh, me exercising my right as an American. Instead of your bio, let's get to the question. Okay, I got you. So my question is, you know, if you had nothing more breaking to talk about than to criticize me, I'd like to know when and where we can have a live debate and discussion. Where, where did I criticize you under? I had a, sure, I had a sign. I was at the Not My President's Day protest, and the sign, it took a couple verses from the book of Matthew, and it replaced it with Republican policies, what Jesus' teachings were. So it was like, you know, if I was hungry and you said drug test those that would ask for food, I was thirsty and you said oil is more important than water, build the pipeline, I was a terrorist and you said, or I was a stranger and you said he's a terrorist, don't let him in. You made an entire segment about me, Tommy, you're one of your last ones to blaze. And, uh, and yeah, I've been doing my channel now for about a year. I raised over, yeah, I raised over a thousand dollars to get here, and I would just like the chance to defend myself. So well, you've done that. Good. You've done a good I job. Really unfortunately, this, unfortunately, I'm gonna listen. I'm a, listen. I'm a, but we have one more minute, and I want to get in an actual question instead of a, instead of your opportunity. No, no, right, right, right. But you know how they t turned your mic off? Yeah. Well, they're not gonna turn it back on. I appreciate it. Listen. Today. So I'm gonna move on to someone. I'm gonna move on to someone else. I think you were brave for showing up. Now shut the fuck up and let somebody else go. Last one. This is the last one, so don't make it your bio. Just make it count. No bio, no political activism here. That was probably one of the few African Americans that just wanted to really understand. Um, I just really wanted to see, um, as a conservative Republican, however you like this. How can you speak to someone that's not an American? I see that uh, there are a lot of polarizing positions that the right makes on the left, and the left makes the right. So I'd like to see where you stand with African American issues. I've seen you speak on KKK. 
Black Lives Matter, but um, in a more intimate setting, speaking to one to my, why would I be a Republican? Why, why should I support a Republican? Before you answer it, I'm going to thank you. Thank you very much. That's the last time we have a question for. I want to give you a chance to answer it. But can you also just, since this is the last minute we have, talk about your answer to that, but also the Republican Party's ability to, to attract African Americans and minorities too? Sure. I don't, first of all, I think that it's um, incredibly condescending to sit here and say, as Republicans and conservatives, we should attract black people and minorities. I don't want to attract anyone. I want people to join the conservative movement if they believe in maximizing freedom. So to me, I don't look at people and I don't look at you as a quota. And I don't look at you as a token. I don't look at you as, boy, we really need more people to vote in this group this way. I look at somebody, and no matter what color they are, no matter what gender they are, no matter how they identify, and I say, if you believe in maximizing freedom, I believe the conservative movement is for you. There is no black conservative movement. There's no young conservative movement. There's no women conservative movement. There's just the conservative movement. We're Americans. We, we gotta go, but listen, I wanna make one last point as we leave. I, what I said a minute ago was true. I'm very close with the people who started Politicon, and this year, conservatives and Democrats, would, conservatives and Democrats wouldn't be on the same stage with each other. Tommy made a point to let me do this with her, and so she's one of the few who's been willing to let a liberal and a loudmouth liberal talk with her, which I think is, which I think is, speaks to your credit and I appreciate it. And I appreciate everybody being here, and thank you so much, Kim Carter, for following me.